This is Retro Reportage. Yesterday's stories, today's podcast. All right, look up. You know that bright white line you see tracing across the blue sky behind a jet? For most of us, that's just, well, it's normal global travel happening. Yeah, pretty routine sight. But uh, for a growing number of people, that trail isn't harmless water vapor at all. They see it as evidence, evidence of like a huge global program. Something hidden, yeah. Manipulating climate, maybe fertility, some even say consciousness. Exactly. They believe it's a deliberate chemical agent being sprayed. The chemtrail theory. Precisely. Welcome to the deep dive. Today we're tackling this chemtrail idea head on. It's a fascinating scientific question, sure, but it's also, you know, one of the most stubborn conspiracy narratives out there in the digital age. It really persists. It does. So our mission here is to really dig into this tension. Are these trails just contrails engine exhaust or is there something uh, more insidious going on? And maybe even more crucially, what does the fact that this belief keeps going tell us about trust, about power, really, in the 21st century? We want to move beyond just saying it's wrong or it's right. We want to understand the atmospheric science and the, well, the psychology behind the suspicion. OK, so let's kick things off with the science, because that's really the bedrock here, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. The consensus from you know actual atmospheric research is pretty clear. These trails, contrails are mostly just water vapor plus some carbon dioxide and really tiny trace amounts of combustion stuff, soot particles, maybe some sulfur. Right, right, standard engine output. Exactly. And up at those high altitudes, it's freezing cold. So all that stuff instantly freezes into tiny ice crystals. OK, so why do some vanish instantly and others stretch across the whole sky? Ah, that's the key question, right? Persistence. Yeah. It's all down to the conditions up there, specifically humidity and temperature. There's this thing meteorologists call the Schmidt-Appelman criteria. Okay. It's basically just the rule for how wet and how cold the air needs to be. Right. If the atmosphere is humid enough, usually above about 70% relative humidity for ice, those little ice crystals just don't evaporate right away. They stick around. They stick around. They stay suspended. They spread out. And they can form those thin, wispy cirrus clouds you sometimes see developing from contrails. So the clouds themselves are made of the same stuff as the short-lived trails. Essentially, yes. Mm. Water ice. And this is critical. The data we have from labs, from satellites, it consistently shows no weird chemical signatures, nothing you wouldn't expect from normal aviation emissions, yeah. just water ice crystals. So physically, the sky is doing what the physics says it should do. Precisely. It's behaving exactly as thermodynamics predicts. But, okay, belief isn't always just about thermodynamics, yeah. right? It's also about what you see and maybe what you already suspect. History plays a huge role. Yeah. When chemtrail believers look up and see those persistent trails, especially when they crisscross into grids, they don't see random air traffic. They see coordination. They see coordination, a pattern. Like exactly. a visible sign of some kind of hidden governance, something being done to us. And you can't just dismiss that interpretation without looking at why people might be primed to think that way. Exactly. We have to trace the suspicion back. There have been documented experiments in the atmosphere. The sky actually has been used as a kind of laboratory, even a military one. That's absolutely right. You know, you can't just ignore the history of actual atmospheric manipulation if you want to understand the fear of it today. The Cold War precedent is... Well, it's undeniable. Cloud seeding. Right? Yeah, starting way back in the 1940s, 50s. Scientists like Schaefer and Langmuir, they pioneered cloud seeding, using stuff like silver iodide or dry ice to try and make it rain. So right there, the line between observing weather and trying to change it got blurred. Instantly. It proved humans could intervene in atmospheric systems. But what really hardened the suspicion, I think, was the military angle. Project Popeye. Project Popeye, exactly. Mm -hmm. Over Vietnam, from 67 to 72, the U.S. military took those cloud seeding techniques and used them specifically to make the monsoon season last longer. To mess with supply lines, turn roads to mud. Yeah, impede enemy logistics. Yeah. And the crucial part was classified until 1974. So when that came out... It established this powerful historical precedent. Governments are willing to mess with nature for strategic reasons and they will hide it. That's a tough foundation to argue against if you're already suspicious. And at the same time all this is happening, the sky itself is just visually changing. Totally. The jet age really took off after the 60s, right? Global aviation exploded. So suddenly, contrails weren't rare anymore. They became commonplace. And air traffic routes naturally form these intersecting lines, these grids. So you have this visual phenomenon, geometric patterns appearing in the sky that, well, 
to someone without deep meteorological knowledge. Or maybe someone already conditioned to distrust. Exactly. It looks totally engineered. It looks like purposeful spraying, even if it's just flight paths converging in the right atmospheric conditions. And then the actual term chemtrails appears. Yeah, that really takes flight in the mid-1990s. Mm. The early internet helped spread it like wildfire. And there was this key moment, a famous misinterpretation, really. The Air Force paper. That's the one. A 1996 U.S. Air Force Academy paper. It was actually just a training manual talking about basic atmospheric chemistry related to engine exhaust, you know, contrail formation. But someone found it, saw the title. It was actually titled Chemtrails. Ironically, yes. That <laughs> title alone was enough. It got circulated everywhere as the smoking gun, the proof of a secret program. And of course, when the Air Force denied it, that just fed the narrative more, didn't it? The classic pattern. Official denial equals confirmation for believers. So this sets up these two almost incompatible ways of knowing, these cultures of evidence that are really at the heart of this whole thing. Yeah, you've got institutional science on one side and what you might call civic observation on the other. Okay, let's just quickly nail down the institutional science case again, the skeptic's view. Sure. So scientifically, the case rests on that thermodynamic consistency, contrail persistence, fully explained by that roughly 70% humidity threshold, way up high. There's no physical mystery why they spread into those thin cirrus clouds it's just ice crystals in moist, cold air. And the logistics argument. Oh, yeah, that's a big one. Skeptics point out, look, to actually change the global climate in any meaningful way with aerosols, you'd need to spray millions, probably tens of millions of tons every single year. That's a staggering amount. It's huge. Hiding that kind of operation, the supply chain for the chemicals, the modified planes, the constant flights, it's just logistically and economically impossible to conceal on that scale. Think about the thousands of flights needed Oops. constantly. Someone would notice pilots, ground crews, air traffic control. Exactly. And then there's the satellite data. NASA satellites like Modius and Calypso, they measure the spectral signatures of these trails. What do they see? Ice. Consistently, they see the signature of ice crystals, not the unique fingerprints you'd expect from metallic aerosols like barium or aluminum or strontium which are often mentioned in the theories. Okay, so if the science is that solid and the logistics seem impossible, why isn't that the end of the story? Why are people out there collecting water samples, soil samples, convinced they're finding proof? Ah, because that gap between the lab results and what people feel they see and experience, that's where the chemtrail narrative absolutely thrives. The civic observation side? Right. The proponent's case isn't really built on complex spectroscopy. It's built on visibility, on lived experience, and often a kind of moral inference. What they see with their own eyes, exactly. Yes. Their core evidence is, look, those trails stick around for hours. They spread out and turn the blue sky hazy. They form these weird grid patterns that don't look like normal airplane routes. This visual data for them feels like truth. It's often way more compelling than someone in a lab coat talking about humidity thresholds. And this leads to the citizen sampling efforts, right? It does. You have groups all over the world collecting rainwater, soil samples, sometimes even snow. And they send them off for analysis, claiming they find elevated levels of metals, usually aluminum, barium, strontium. And for them, that is the physical evidence. It's powerful social proof within the movement, absolutely. Yeah. But the scientific community consistently pushes back on two main points. Okay, what are they? First, context. Aluminum, barium, strontium. These are actually pretty common elements in the Earth's crust. So finding them in soil or even rainwater isn't automatically weird. It could easily be from natural sources like windblown dust, volcanic ash, or even local industrial pollution or runoff, especially near mines or certain factories. So you need a baseline, a control, precisely. And that's the second point, methodology. Unfortunately, most of these citizen sampling efforts lack the rigorous protocols needed. You need meticulous collection methods, careful handling, proper lab procedures, and critically, you need to demonstrate that the metals actually came from the sky, specifically from those trails, and aren't just background contamination. That's really, really hard to do without strict scientific controls. So the cycle continues. The samples get dismissed scientifically. Which the believers then often interpret as further proof of a cover-up. See, they don't want to admit what we found. It reinforces the distrust. Okay, we've got the physics, the history, the sampling debate, but now things take a really interesting twist, don't they? Because the mainstream scientific community itself started talking about something that sounds suspiciously familiar. Ah, uh, yes, geoengineering. This is where the controversy really moves from the 
let's say, fringe towards actual global policy discussion. And it hands the chemtrail believers maybe their strongest talking point yet. It's a critical convergence, no doubt about it. You have genuine scientific proposals now for something called solar radiation management, or SRM, sometimes called stratospheric aerosol injection, SAI. What is that exactly? Well, it's a proposed way to combat global warming. The idea is to intentionally inject reflective particles, things like sulfates, maybe calcium carbonate, high up into the stratosphere. To reflect sunlight back into space and cool the planet down. Exactly. And, of course, this proposed action, deliberately spraying aerosols into the atmosphere from aircraft to alter the climate, sounds almost identical to what chemtrail believers have been saying governments are already doing secretly. Wow. So the conspiracy theory and the actual scientific proposal are mirroring each other. They really are. And what's fascinating is how this plays out psychologically. For someone who already believes in chemtrails, hearing about SRM research like projects at Harvard or elsewhere seriously studying aerosol injection. Sounds like confirmation. It sounds like absolute confirmation. Not a coincidence, not a future possibility, but proof that they are finally admitting, or at least openly researching, what they've been secretly doing all along. Mm. That psychological gap between researching spraying aerosols and actually spraying aerosols just vanishes in the public mind. It feels like a retroactive admission of guilt, almost. To many, yes. It feeds directly into that feeling that the government has been lying for decades. And this taps into something much bigger, doesn't it? This isn't just about atmospheric chemistry anymore. It's about trust. Absolutely. The chemtrail narrative fundamentally condenses this broader, quite pervasive anxiety many people feel that modern life is increasingly managed by invisible forces, by complex technologies we don't understand, run by institutions we don't fully trust, military, scientific, governmental. Right. The belief thrives in that soil of declining confidence. When policy discussions like those around geoengineering happen in ways that feel opaque or lack broad public consent, it just validates the core fear. Powerful people are doing potentially world-altering things without telling us, without asking us. There's also a sense of agency, maybe. That's a really insightful point. Think about it. Feeling powerless against huge, impersonal threats like climate change or widespread pollution is terrifying. Yeah, it feels overwhelming. But the idea they are spraying us, well, suddenly that chaos has an author. It has an enemy you can identify. It replaces that terrifying, vague sense of collective vulnerability with a simpler, more graspable narrative being targeted. It personalizes the risk. So if this whole debate boils down to, as you said, the chemistry of trust, where does it go from here? Especially now that geoengineering is moving from sci-fi to actual feasibility studies, what do the potential futures look like? Well, the research suggests the key drivers are going to be that increasing feasibility of geoengineering, yes, but also the inevitable push towards commercializing climate control technologies. And that brings new kinds of secrecy into play. Not just military classification anymore. Right. Now you'll have economic confidentiality, trade secrets, intellectual property concerns. That adds another layer of opacity, another reason why people might feel things are being hidden. Okay, so what are the scenarios? We basically see two diverging paths outlined in the research. First, there's what we might call the risk scenario. Let's call it the technocratic atmosphere. Sounds ominous. Well, imagine if we keep missing climate targets. Things get desperate. And maybe a nation or a coalition of nations decides to deploy SRM, stratospheric aerosol injection, on an emergency basis. Without broad global agreement or maybe even full transparency. Exactly. Perhaps arguing there's no time. In that situation, the thing that the chemtrail movement has warned about for decades, large-scale, state-sponsored atmospheric spraying could actually materialize, not as a secret conspiracy, but as official policy enacted without full democratic legitimacy. That would be explosive. It would seem to validate every fear. It would absolutely confirm the worst suspicions of the existing movement and likely drawn in many, many more people. The myth would have become reality, just not in the way they originally thought. Okay, so that's the bleak path. What's the alternative? The hope scenario. The hope scenario, let's call it the citizen sky, hinges entirely on the opposite principles. Transparency and participation, how would that work? Imagine a future where, if any atmospheric interventions are considered or deployed, the process is radically open. And critically, you implement widespread participatory monitoring. Think about crowdsourcing atmospheric data using low-cost sensors, maybe built into phones or deployed on drones, all feeding into open source platforms that anyone can access in real time. So people could check for themselves what's in the air. Precisely. If the public can actively participate in verifying what is, or crucially, isn't being sprayed, 
if they have real-time access to credible data that they help generate, then the narrative could shift. From conspiracy to... What? Maybe towards a culture of citizen audit, co-governance even. It provides an immediate, verifiable counter-narrative to secrecy and suspicion. It doesn't mean everyone suddenly trusts the government, but it means trust isn't blind faith. It's based on accessible evidence. So we're left with these two starkly different realities wrestling with each other. Yeah, you have the physical evidence, which overwhelmingly points to contrails just being contrails. It's physics. But then you have the cultural evidence, which reveals this really deep and frankly understandable anxiety about technology getting ahead of our control about governance happening in the shadows. It's less about the molecules themselves. And much more about moral accountability, about the right to know what's happening in the sky above you, especially if it might affect you. So the real challenge isn't about convincing everyone that chemtrails aren't real. It's maybe bigger than that. I think so. It's about building a world, designing systems, where truth doesn't require you to either have blind faith in authority figures or descend into corrosive secrecy and suspicion. It leaves us with a really profound ethical question, doesn't it? Especially thinking about geoengineering. If nations ever did decide they needed to deploy something like aerosol injection legitimately to try and save the planet, wow. how on earth would they get informed consent? How do you do that on a planetary scale? That's the multi-trillion dollar question, isn't it? Yeah. And this whole chemtrail debate, whether the trails are real or not in the way believers think, it just perfectly highlights how fragile that line between observing something unusual and accusing someone of wrongdoing becomes when transparency breaks down. When trust arose. Exactly. <laughs> so maybe the ultimate question isn't just, are chemtrails real? Mm. But something more like, can our democracy actually survive the perception justified or not that they might be? That something that profound could be happening without our knowledge or consent? Thank you for joining us today on Retro Reportage. We'll be releasing many more stories from the past in the near future, so be sure to stay tuned. If you enjoyed this episode, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, and share your thoughts in the comments below. We'd love to hear your reactions, your own experiences, or ideas for future episodes. Until next time, thanks for listening to yesterday's stories told today. Enjoyed this video? You can support Retro Reportage by buying me a coffee. Just scan the QR code on screen or visit buymeacoffee.com slash retro reportage.